I'm Eddie Zaneski. Uh, I serve the developer community at AWS from Denver, Colorado. Uh, and I also serve the Kubernetes community as the co-chair of SIG CLI, which is the special interest group uh, for the command line tools for Kubernetes. So kube control, basically anything that you're going to be running or using, uh, that's the, the code that, that my group maintains. And so today I'm here to talk to you a, a bit about Kubernetes. Uh, like I said, I, I've, I've been um, doing Kubernetes for roughly four to five years now, and I've been at uh, AWS for a year. So I like to get started with you. I'd love to know more about your experience. So we have a little chat box on the GoToMeeting. If you could please drop in a zero to five, a zero being you are not using Kubernetes and don't plan to, uh, one being you are just starting your Kubernetes journey, and a five is you have been running Kubernetes in production for a few years now. So please drop that in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that as it comes in. We got a three. Any other folks? There's lots of y'all on the call, please. <laughs> so I'm going to assume that we're mostly around that maybe one to three area in terms of Kubernetes. So as far as an agenda goes, um, I'd like to start with uh, defining what Kubernetes is. Um, I don't want to spend too long or getting too deep into it. Uh, like Ron said, you'll have some further deep and product and technical dives um, in future sessions. I'm going to tell a short story, uh, and I'm going to give you some advice in embarking on your journey. So before we can actually talk about what Kubernetes is, I like to start with what a container is. And so even for the, the seasoned folks out there who you know, have been running containers for a while and you know, can write a Docker file in their sleep, uh, I want you to think real hard about how you would actually define a container to someone who's unfamiliar. Um, it seems like a simple concept, but it's actually hard to pinpoint a definition to. And that's why I actually really like Docker's definition that they have on their website. It says, a container is a standard unit of software that packages up code in all its dependencies so the application runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to another. And I think the most important part of this uh, is the code in all its dependencies. You know, we've been able to build uh, binaries, we've been able to build fat jars in Java, uh, but the, the thing that's always been missing is maybe that runtime, right? So maybe you don't have your JVM uh, or you don't have your JavaScript interpreter or your PHP interpreter. And so Docker and containers uh, allow us to take everything that our application needs. So I can hand it off to a server, I can hand it off to a colleague, and they can run that uh, the application in the same exact environment that it would in production from one machine to another, right? So it eliminates that it works on my machine. And then I like to talk through this container evolution. And so, you know, when we initially started deploying software to, to servers and, and the data center, uh, we kind of wind up with this traditional deployment here, right? So you have a metal server somewhere. This is racked and stacked. Maybe you have your own, maybe you're co-located somewhere. We install an operating system on top of that. And then you can deploy your software and your applications on top of that operating system. So very small, very simple. You don't have a lot of flexibility. It's just pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship here. And we moved into virtualized deployment, right? So these are your VMs that run in the clouds, your EC2 instances. And so it's pretty much the same layer, but we actually add another one on this hypervisor. Uh, if you're not familiar with what a hypervisor is, it basically oversees creation and management of virtual machines. And so now, we have our, our base layer, and then we can create those virtual machines. So we can carve up that one big machine into smaller machines. And each of those VMs get their own operating system, their own binaries and libraries, and their own application code deployment, right? So there's obviously some duplication of waste here. You know, if you have a, a Windows install server or a Ubuntu server install, right? That, that's what, one to six gigabytes now, I believe. And so that's every single VM has an extra copy of that operating system. That's a ton of overhead that you're throwing in here. Enter containers, All right? And so I think this is where we have a, a lot of power and we've really um, pushed the boundaries of how we deploy software. So we've replaced out that hypervisor with the container runtime. This would be your Docker, your Podmans, your Cryos. And the container runtime is what schedules, uh, you know, kind of carves up and, and says what containers should be running. And then we have our, our containers. And if you notice, they don't have an operating system in there. And this is because we can use some awesome features such as copy on write. 
where we can take the, the host kernel, so we can take the operating system, the kernel from the actual server or the, or the VM, and we can mount that and share that into the container. And so those containers basically have a full copy on write access to that operating system, meaning that they don't duplicate any of those files unless they need to make a copy and make changes to it. Then they get their own copy. But we, we've severely slimmed down uh, how we run these things. And so this is the journey that we've gone through with containers. And that brings us to talking about Kubernetes. And so Kubernetes is definitely a, a project, a community. It's a movement. It's, it's many things. Uh, the formal definitions that we have of Kubernetes, it's a container orchestration system, which started as an open source project from the folks over at Google. Uh, internally, it was known as Borg and many other names. And it's what we call the heart of the cloud native movement. We're going to talk more about cloud native in a little bit. Uh, it's designed to run everywhere from on-premises to the cloud. So I actually have a Raspberry Pi cluster in my network closet around the corner uh, running a full four-node Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so you know this can run on ARM, very small IoT devices. Uh, right now, it's running in F-16 uh, fighter jets. The Air Force has deployed Kubernetes to actual jets. You may have seen the article recently. And so this is really designed to run just about everywhere, in your own data centers, in a managed service in the cloud. Uh, some of the highlighting features are it has automatic scaling and self-healing. And so you can basically scale out uh, vertically, horizontally. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a bit. And when uh, your applications die, it's Kubernetes' job to go and replace them and recreate them. Finally, it's got an innovative declarative resource model, which is a mouthful, uh, but we're going to talk about that in a second, uh, of how Kubernetes persists and stores data. Quick overview of the architecture. Uh, this is a, a pretty intimidating diagram if you haven't seen it before. So we'll break it down in small pieces. So over here, we have the Kubernetes control plane. Uh, this has all of the, the, the core cluster. So if you're using a, ma a managed service like EKS, Amazon uh, Elastic Kubernetes service, uh, this will be isolated from you. You generally don't actually get access and you can't tweak any of these components. And so in the center here, you can see everything kind of points to the Kube API server. So I mentioned Kubernetes is API driven. Everything's an API, everything's a resource. And so the way this model works is your clients, so your developer that is trying to do a deployment, will make a request to the Kubernetes API server that says, hey, I'd like this container to be running. Kubernetes will write that to its etcd data store, which is a distributed key value store. And then we have these different controller managers and kind of control loops. So the kube control manager kind of oversees all the internals and the core features of Kubernetes. And so this is always running in a big loop. And it's checking, hey, does anything need to be done? Uh, and so it, it's great at transitioning state uh, of our infrastructure from one place to where it needs to be. Uh, and then we have the kube scheduler. This is kind of, this could be part of the kube controller, but there, it's so tweakable and there's so many decisions that get decided on what uh, container runs on what uh, worker node that we break this out as its own component that you can actually tweak and replace and make your own copies of. So that's the core units in the control plane. And then we can take a look over here at the, the worker nodes. So these, these are your actual servers that you're deploying. Um, these are the ones you get access to in a managed service. And so these are uh, disposable, you can think of them, right? And what's great about Kubernetes is whether we have one node or three, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Uh, what matters is that we have a pool of resources in the cloud. And so we have you know, maybe 32 CPUs in this cluster and 86 gigs of RAM, right? Uh, sure, you want to have, you know, a high availability. You want to have multiple nodes for fallover and failback. But it really doesn't matter, right? You shouldn't be worrying about what this is no longer a database server. This is no longer my web server. Um, Kubernetes is smart enough to figure out that it can, your application defines, I'd like to run with two CPUs and four gigs of RAM. And Kubernetes will go schedule that in an available node and move it if that node gets too full and create another copy. Um, and so we have a couple pieces on here. The kubelet, this is pretty much the daemon that's talking to that API server. It's seeing, hey, this pod should be running. It says it should be running on me. It's not actually running on me, so maybe I should start it. And then kubeproxy is kind of just a network translation that all these things can mesh together nicely. Last piece we have here, 
Cloud Controller Manager, uh, this is kind of just a, another one of those control loops that we can uh, extend and plug into Kubernetes. Uh, this allows us to tie things directly to a cloud provider. So this lets, lets us say, hey, I'd like you to deploy this application with a load balancer. Uh, this is the piece that lets uh, AWS say, okay, you're going to get an application load balancer. So it actually lets it create an application load balancer in your account, wire it up, and all that jazz. So take a look at the, the site here. The, it's pretty complicated, as always, but uh, once you start playing with the pieces, it makes a little more sense. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on these manifests, but I just want to show you what they look like if you haven't seen them before. So uh, a pod is the basic unit of Kubernetes. Uh, this is generally not what you're going to create yourself. Uh, a pod usually maps one-to-one -one with the container. It, a pod can have multiple containers, but there's very few reasons why you'd actually want to do this. Uh, if you notice here, there are four kind of major fields that every Kubernetes manifest will have. Uh, and this uh, YAML, uh, this language syntax is called YAML. It's a key value markup language, basically. And so we define an API version, what kind of resource this is. Metadata holds some things like name and some arbitrary labels, like key value pairs. Uh, and then the spec is the specification. This is like the meat of the resource that you define. So again, you don't create pods yourself. Deployments, uh, this is generally the, the piece that you're actually going to work and create with. Uh, a deployment will kind of represent a deployment of your software. Uh, this will actually go out and create those pods for you. Uh, they're pretty much isolated by default. They can't talk to each other. They can't talk to anything else. And so uh, we need to expose those with what we call a service. So a, a service has generally three types, a cluster IP, which is kind of an internal only service, a node port, which makes your service available uh, externally from all of your worker nodes by IP uh, and a port number. So you generally can't map DNS to that. Uh, and then a load balancer again, which you know this lets AWS spin up a you know elastic load balancer for you, which you can route DNS to, SSL, all that jazz. So uh, these are the three pieces that you're going to play with the most. Um, just trying to give you some exposure and not dive too deep. I mentioned cloud native earlier. Uh, you're going to see this landscape map. This is the, the CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Uh, this is what houses the Kubernetes project and a bunch of other projects. Uh, Google started this and, and donated Kubernetes to the CNCF. Uh, this gets memed a lot, and it's ever-growing, looks complicated. The truth is it's a vibrant ecosystem, so don't be overwhelmed by seeing all these vendors. You may see some logos you recognize, some you don't. Um, you know, Frequent, check it out. Uh, you can click through, read about them, it's different pieces here. When you're switching to Kubernetes and containers, you kind of have to change your entire way that you uh, monitor things, right? So you just have to learn some new practices. I mentioned this gets memed. Just wanted to share two of my favorites. This is the classic 1,000-piece uh, puzzle edition. And then, of course, we have Charlie Day uh, trying to figure out the, the Kubernetes map here. So I want to tell you a quick story. I want you to picture yourself back in 2017. Uh, you are a operations engineer on a small machine learning startup. And your director of marketing comes to you and is you know, telling you that they're having trouble with the, the WordPress site that they have, you know, that we have our blog on. And so you start looking at it, start digging in, start realizing that this awesome director of marketing spun up a a DigitalOcean droplet many years ago with a one-click WordPress install that has been running with a you know four-year-old version of WordPress and PHP, and that's the reason that their software is not working. So naturally, you're tasked with migrating this to your internal infrastructure, which you just happen to be using something called Kubernetes. And so WordPress is notoriously difficult for containerizing. It's gotten a lot better over the past couple of years, but uh, WordPress relies heavily on local storage and Kubernetes is not that great at providing local storage. We've gotten a lot better over the years, but it's very complicated. So naturally, you start asking around, talking to your team, and they tell you to, oh, you just have to write some YAML to get it deployed. And you know, you're not that familiar with YAML, so you go out, you find some manifests, and you kind of copy and paste them from your internal repo, and you make a little change here or there, and, takes you a while to get this deployed, but you finally get Kubernetes deployed. You've learned a little bit of YAML, and you've deployed your application, right? So this, this was basically my first experience to Kubernetes, was back in 2017. 
Uh, I had no idea what it was, never heard of it before. I knew containers pretty well, but the Kubernetes thing had kind of blown over my head. Uh, and I jumped in and I learned a ton. It took me a long time to get WordPress containerized and deployed, but we eventually got there. Uh, and I fell in love with the community and I fell in love with uh, Kubernetes as a, a concept and, and an idea. So fast forward to 2021, where are we? Uh, well, personally, I still copy and paste YAML manifests. Uh, I guess some things never change. And so uh, we're definitely more mature as a project. Uh, there's a lot more options out there. That landscape keeps growing. Uh, you can make some decisions for stability. Uh, it does become increasingly complicated, yet makes things easier. So I often say that Kubernetes solves a lot of problems and introduces a lot more. Persistent storage has gotten a lot better. Uh, we have a thing called the, the CSI, the Container Storage Interface. Uh, this basically lets uh, EKS map you know, elastic volumes to your, uh, your pods and your containers and your worker nodes and kind of migrate them around. So it makes your workloads portable again. Kubernetes has grown a lot. We have these things called CAPS. These are the Kubernetes Enhancement Protocol uh, uh, proposals. This is how anyone can get a feature into Kubernetes. You start by writing a design doc, basically. There's lots of many problems. Uh, there's many problems to solve. They're definitely fun problems. So it's definitely not a solved problem, right? We're mature, but we have a long ways to go. I wanna share some quick advice that I've learned over my journey to hopefully get you started. Start a home lab. Uh, this is the number one thing I recommend to everybody. So this was the beginning of my Raspberry Pi Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I started with three nodes, and then these are all powered over a power by uh, ethernet switch, PoE and then a little uh, Raspberry Pi PoE hat. And it's a great place to get started. Go and buy some for your team if you are a manager. Uh, it, extremely inexpensive, and it gives folks a way to dig in and not be afraid. So you can experiment and learn without risk, and you are given the opportunity to really like own something and just start learning and, and breaking things. Uh, it also lets you play with the latest and greatest. Most cloud providers lag behind two to three versions of, of Kubernetes release. Um, so you definitely want to be you know, learning some of the new features and playing with uh, new deployment tools and other things out there. So a couple things to check out. Uh, K3S is the Kubernetes distribution that I use. It's a lightweight IoT distribution. Longhorn is a pretty awesome distributed storage. It gives you a CSI that you can do locally. Uh, Pi-hole is a fun thing that you can deploy. Uh, this lets you block DNS and ad trackers on your network. And then Home Assistant uh, is software I've absolutely fallen in love with lately. Uh, this lets you tie all of your different smart home pieces together. Here's a picture of my home lab now. Off to the side is a big switch that powers all the devices in my home through power over Ethernet. Um, fair warning, this is addictive. So just be ready to wind yourself, find yourself replacing all of your light switches with Z-Wave light switches and, and things being confusing. Uh, wrapping up, uh, I'd like you to join the community. We're extremely welcoming and inclusive. This is a picture of the uh, developer summit from uh, San Diego. I'm somewhere in the back there. Uh, contributions to Kubernetes come in all shapes and sizes. So, you know, from documentations to just issue triages to just helping someone out on Slack, definitely check that out. Uh, right here is a link to the uh, Kubernetes SIGs. So uh, everything in Kubernetes is driven by these special interest groups generally. And so there's SIGs for just about everything. Uh, SIG CLI is a group that I work under. Uh, there's also a SIG contributor experience, which is where most folks start. This kind of oversees the community. Uh, they have tons of mentoring and office hours. So check out the Kubernetes SIGs. Check out the Kubernetes dev website. This has all the developer documentation. And join us on Slack, please. Uh, last couple bits, uh, use a managed service. Uh, you definitely don't want to manage Kubernetes yourself if you don't have to. Uh, same thing goes with databases. You got to figure out how much operational workload you want to take on. Focus on building things and not maintaining. Uh, learn the resource model in Kubernetes. Everything is an API. Uh, you'll learn things called group version resources. Uh, this is kind of, you'll see this referenced a few different places, but learning this will help you a ton. It's just kind of how we define a API path to a given resource. Uh, and there's some awesome tools that I don't have time to show you. Uh, Tube Control Explain will let you uh, tube control explain deployment, what kind of give you the API documentation for what a deployment is. Uh, you can also toss a dash V7 through 9 generally tag on there. This is a verbose output. It'll show you kind of all the API requests that are made under the hood. 
Uh, extend Kubernetes, custom resource definitions are awesome. Admission webhooks lets you do things without writing a lot of code. You can set up some filters to you know, reject uh, deployments and resources. Uh, building a controller is awesome. Uh, it's how everything runs in, inside of the Kubernetes loop and you really want to dive in. Uh, check out the QBuilder book, it's really good. So in summary, take a breath, start small, break things, have fun while doing it, and join the community. So thanks for having me.